You're listening to JS Party, the award-winning weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Good news, everyone! Our new weekly podcast plus email newsletter covers all the developer news that's worth your attention. We keep it brief, entertaining, and always on point. Check out Changelog News at changelog.com slash news. Seriously, do it. Thanks to our partners at Fastly for shipping JS Party all around the world to wherever you listen. And to fly.io. Host your app close to your users. No ops required. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. Hoi hoi! Welcome to another exciting JS party. I'm your host this week, Nick Nisi, and I am joined uh, by my good friend and yours, Mr. K-Ball. K-Ball, how's it going? Going good. Ready to have some fun, get a little goofy, and learn about Open Next to JS. <laughs> so exciting. Yeah, and with that, to uh, to help introduce Open Next and the serverless stack, is that what SST stands for? Oh, that's a, that's a long story. We can get into that in a little cool, bit. Cool, cool. Yeah. And that voice you hear is Mr. Dax Rad. Dax, how's it going? Good. Glad to be here. Good to meet you all. Really excited to have you here. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So uh, my name is Dax. I work on an open source framework called SST. We are very focused on helping people build applications on AWS. Really just focus on the serverless pieces of AWS, what we think are the parts you should be focusing on. And uh, we build a framework that really smooths out the rough edges of what can otherwise sometimes be a painful experience as as many people know yes <laughs> uh yeah definitely so i guess to start off like what is sst how did you how did you get involved with it and what uh how how is it doing that smoothing yeah sure i can give you a little bit of it, like my story with kind of how i ended up joining uh which is maybe a little bit interesting so I'm, I'm a software engineer. I've been a software engineer for a little over 10 years now. My entire career pretty much has been either founding companies or very early stage or consulting at uh, early stage startups. Uh, so I basically was taking a break after one of those stints where I did work at a bigger company as a director of engineering where I didn't touch any code at all. And I wasn't doing, I mean, I went from like just touching every single part of a company, you know, working at early stage companies to then having a very like narrow management, like middle management role. And at that time I had been doing everything in Elixir, Terraform, Kubernetes, like, you know, just kind of deploying containers. That's how I viewed the software world. And because my role was just a full-time manager, I was like, I got a, I got a lot of time in my hands. Like I have time to learn other stuff. Let me just mix it up and try to learn something new. So I found this whole serverless thing which at the time I just thought was like a little toy they can use for like you know, little utility things here and there. But I found like a whole group of people talking about how you can build like real full applications this way. Uh, the benefits of doing that, not just technical, but even impacts on your business, how that enables all kinds of new business models. And it really clicked for me. So I started to get more into, okay, let me try to build stuff in this way. It's very different from everything I was doing before. I think I was doing before it was very stateful. Everything here is, you know, stateless and event driven. Uh, so I was learning all of that. And in, the, in that process, I was like, the experience around this like kind of sucks. I can tell that there's like a lot of potential here, but my little experience of doing all this, like there's so many unsolved questions, anything from like, how do I do local development to, okay, I have like a AP, like a secret, like, where do I put that? You know, there's all kinds of just stuff I had to figure out for myself. So I was in the process of doing that when I found, and I was building some of my own tooling at this time, just to make it easier. Like it's really bad tooling. It just wasn't very good. I found SST, which had recently launched and I started to use it and I was like, oh, look, they address a lot of the things that I was trying to solve myself. And it was very early, so I was contributing a lot back to it. Like I was like actually asking them to like rewrite like entire parts of it. So I was a very heavy handed contributor. And they were actually they were kind of going through YC at the time. Uh, and they said, okay, we're raising a round. And I actually decided to invest because I was like, okay, I believe that the future is gonna be more serverless. And these people have been in that space for a while. They're trying to like do something there. I'm sure eventually they'll figure something out. So I invested in the company and I continue to contribute. And a few months later, I ended up just joining them. And the joke I make is, uh, it's a very tax inefficient way just to do all of this. Like I invested money in them, then they give it back to me when I joined them and I owe taxes on it. So it was just kind of like a dumb, dumb circle. But yeah, that's how I got interested and in, involved in it. So I think that answers the first half of your question, but I'll pause there. 
I'd love to learn a little bit more about SST and what is, you know, for example, different between SST and architect or other things that people have tried to do in this space of making uh, kind of a, an architecture framework for serverless applications. Yeah. So at the end of the day, like there's just a few things, if you're trying to do something like this, there's a few things you just need to do. And I think people typically start in the same place. So when you do these serverless systems, another way to think of them as they're very serviceful. So you're like really taking advantage of all these primitives that your cloud provider has. Obviously, people think of things like functions, but there's also things like queues or event buses or cron jobs, just all kinds of little primitives that you need spun up so you can actually use it. So a place where a lot of these frameworks start is on the infrastructure as code side. So you want to be able to define all the things you need. And this tool needs to be able to actually like deploy them, right? And that's kind of where SSC started. It started as an infrastructure as code tool where you could define all of these things and we're built on top of CDK. So even if you go outside of like the bubble we focus on, you, just, you can still use SSC to like orchestrate all kinds of things. And so that's where we started. Then we just discovered rough edge by rough edge by rough edge and we continue to progress that way. So the first thing is local development, right? Spinning up a full copy of the, your whole app is actually a pretty awesome way to do uh, like just development when you're working on an application. But the feedback loops, whenever you update a function code or whatever, now you need to like recompile that code, upload to AWS, wait for the function to restart. And that was like at best a four to five second feedback loop, which is just kind of unacceptable. So we saw, so okay, that's a clear problem. That's going to make people use this stuff and say, I hate it. I don't want to use it. Uh, so let's try to figure out how to, how to address that. Right? And we did that by, and that was kind of the first feature that really like kind of put us on the map, which was our live Lambda debugging. So we made it so uh, the feedback loop was now can be now measured in like milliseconds, effectively instant. You can have breakpoints, all of this kind of stuff that you're used to in a local environment, even though it's still, you know, running in this like cloud, cloud world. And your environment still is nearly 99% identical to what actually gets deployed. So there's not really any like discrepancies from, okay, it works on my machine. Why doesn't it work when I deploy? So that's where we started. But basically that's the pattern that we took. Like we'll, we'll solve the biggest pain point and we'll solve the next biggest pain point. We'll solve the next biggest pain point. And over time, our scope has gotten extremely broad. And we'll probably talk some about this in a little bit, but uh, now we're going all the way to like, how do we deploy these more complex front ends to AWS? Now we're like very deep in the front end world, like doing a bunch of things to help front end projects get deployed. Uh, so, but that, that was the, like, we're, our scope is crazy now. And I, and I love it. Cause I feel like no matter what's going on in the tech world, like we have a way to participate in that, which is really awesome. Like, I don't ever feel like, okay, we're kind of stuck in our little zone, but yeah, it started out pretty narrow and it has gotten, gotten wider over time. That's awesome. So one, I wanted to take a step back maybe and ask how you envision a team like deciding to use SST? Like what's, is, is there like a common path that, that you think teams take to that? Is it like, we want to build this and then, oh, we want to build it on top of AWS, AWS's stack and then. Yeah. So, uh, and th this, this has changed over time as we've like expanded to more, like just bigger audiences. But in the beginning it was people that were already pretty competent with AWS already understood like the serverless mindset and the benefits of it. And they knew that they wanted to build that way. And so first our, our initial, you know, product goals were to say, okay, there's a bunch of tools. If you already know all that stuff, I know you can like assemble all that yourself. And cause you are, are very skilled with all this stuff, but use our framework. Cause we kind of encode a lot of those best practices that you already know to do in it. Uh, over time, it's now become, okay, then like, let's expand to anyone that just wants to use AWS in general, but they may not know about serverless. They may not know that, okay, there's like a million services in AWS, like which approach do I do? So there, a lot of our work was just making it feel like the easiest way to use AWS period, even if you're not even aware of like all like the lofty serverless philosophies and, and all of that. So at the end of the day, there's just a certain set of businesses that will always need to use AWS, typically the type of things I work on, you know, like just kind of bigger companies, like even startups. I mean, a lot of our focus is on startups, just startups that are trying to become bigger companies. There's just most companies, when they get successful, end up on AWS anyway. Certain people recognize that from day one, so just start there. But starting on AWS historically has meant like a lot of learning and a lot of things to figure out. So, And they've helpfully left a lot of friction in there for you to uh, smooth out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the thing I always say is I have like a weird 
mindset with all this stuff because uh on some level, I'm like frustrated that AWS isn't better in certain ways. I'm always like, oh, why can't they do this? Why can't they make this better? And I'm always running up into that. But then I also recognize that our whole opportunity to do what we do is because they do leave that gap. And that's kind of where we step in. Yeah, I, was, I was raising my hand there for a minute. I, I uh, can't see your hand. I noticed it like go up on the YouTube. I can, see, I can only see like your face because the screen's cut in thirds on Riverside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was raising my hand in the uh, not not up to date on all of the AWS oh, yeah, pieces yeah, exactly. part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's impossible. Like we spend, I spend a, like my full time job is so I, and it's not even as simple as like, okay, you want to do this thing, you learn the service in AWS. It's actually you want to do this thing. There's nine different ways to do it in AWS. Which one is actually the correct one to do? So a lot of our work is spent trying everything and figuring out, okay, this is this is the best option. We just code that as a default in the framework. And there's always escape hatches, but a big reason people use us is because we have a sensible set of defaults uh, when using something as big and complicated as AWS. So you have defaults at the infrastructure level of like what stuff is coming out. How does that play out into the application level uh, in terms of whether it's like how you design your application or what frameworks you you can or can't use or things like that? Yep. Uh, So over time, we have just... I think we have the unique advantage that we see thousands of companies uh, just using our framework and we can see the issues that they run into at all kinds of scale. So over time in the application layer, we have started to form more opinions. These opinions aren't super encoded into the framework. So we're, you can still do whatever you want, but our standard templates that you know spawn out of the box, there are certain patterns that we encourage. Like, you know, we have like a pretty standard monorepo setup that we think works for most people. Uh, we're big believers in domain driven design, but like a light version of it. So you're not just loading all this business logic in your functions, which then makes it inaccessible in other places where you need it. So we have like a separation of your domain layer, which then gets called into from your functions layer, which could be an API or like maybe scripts or, you know, whatever else you need. So we have like rough patterns that are in our templates that we've seen work like literally for anyone. Uh, people always deviate, of course, and that's kind of, you know, as someone that builds an open source framework, you have to kind of have judgment on this because the more you let people deviate, uh, the higher support burden you have. A big thing we do is we have, uh, we're very active in our help channels. Like we try to like make sure everyone is addressed and, and not blocked. Typically our highest support burden comes from people that deviate from our standard templates. Uh, the reality is like, this is a complex space, like even just Node.js. Like anything as simple as I'm going to have a package and I'm going to import it from another package. It's like, okay, how are you bundling the package? How are you building the package? Are you like specifying things correctly in package JSON? There's just a lot that people aren't aware of when they go to do some of these things. So I think people take on a complexity that they don't expect and they kind of end up in in our, in our help channel. And that kind of is more support burden for us. So over time we've been kind of pushing more to have a little bit more opinion, but Generally, we're still going to be like very flexible. Like our, our model is an open source model. We're not a managed service. So a benefit open source model is you can kind of bring your own libraries, frameworks, whatever it is, and you kind of expect that to work. Well, and that ties into a question, which is you brought up this as a company that's raised funding and all the sorts of different things, but it's also an open source framework. What is the business model? Like what, and you know, we as developers are always a little skeptical of incentives. Like How are you aligning your incentives and the open source pieces of this with developers? Yeah, so uh, yes, we are a business and we're doing this not for any altruistic reasons. We're here to try to make a lot of money. Like that's straight up why why we're here. So the reason we are open source is because we actually believe in the model like strategically. The thing I said earlier is we're not trying to create some idealized platform for doing development because we fundamentally don't believe that those types of platforms work at scale. Everyone just needs to do things a little bit different. And yes, maybe your idealized version is like a much better experience in SST. But the reality is, is technology is always shifting. There's new frameworks coming out. Like uh, you just can't predict this stuff. So I fundamentally believe something like this needs to be open source because we need help integrating with all kinds of things. So we've integrated with like every single like meta framework, not every single one. We're like not done with this. We're continuing to do more and more of this, but you know, integrating with things like Astro with Remix with Next.js. I didn't know any of this was going to, I didn't know that a lot of this was going to exist, you know, years ago. Right. So we believe in the open source model. Whenever there's a feature that we want to build, if it can be built in an open source way, we're going to put it in the framework. 
our business model for making money is there are certain things you need once you go to prod that doesn't really make sense as a to be part of the framework. Our strategy is pretty simple. When our users go to prod, there's additional services they're using to like, you know, round out the prod experience. It might be anything like error reporting. Maybe they're using Sentry to catch exceptions. Uh, it might be something they're using for logging. So we are, and we're starting the pro process of this now, we're building complementary, completely optional services that uh, integrate very nicely with SST. So because we deploy all your infrastructure, we know exactly what to monitor for exceptions. No configuration, we'll catch all your exceptions, we'll alert you, do all of that kind of Sentry-like experience for that. So we can do these complementary things. Even those things we're actually building in an open source way. So if you want, you could go self-host that whole control plane and do everything. Um, I mean, we don't think anyone is actually gonna do it. We're open sourcing it more so people can learn from how we, how we build things. Uh, but that's open source, but obviously we're gonna have our own hosted version of that, that people sign up and pay for. Uh, and this model has been like, ex has exists in a bunch of other places and I think is well proven. The, the thing we look at is in the Laravel ecosystem. Uh, Laravel is the framework, kind of similar to Next.js or something like that. So there's a lot, lot more like complete. Uh, and then Vapor is a deployment platform for Laravel projects, which you pay for. Uh, and it contains like a bunch of production level features you need. So we have like no shortage of ideas for stuff there. Uh, so we're not super concerned about the monetization part. Just given where our framework sits, they're just like infinite opportunities. Interesting. I've seen this, as you highlight, this is a very common approach to dev tooling. Most of the companies I've seen try to do this end up failing in some form or being acquired. And often they're acquired by companies that still maintain the tooling and, and some of that, right? Like they're maintained, acquired by the big hosting companies. And so a question I have is how are you handling governance of the open source pieces of this such that if SST, the company goes out of business or is acquired or something like that, we still have some amount of, there's some amount of continuity for the framework. Yeah. At the end of the day, there's no way to guarantee continuity. Um, because uh, right now we're able to fund ourselves doing this. We actually have another product that predates SST that makes a good amount of money. And that's where a lot of our sustainability comes from. We're kind of transitioning over to like a more SST focused product now. Uh, there's a chance that SST can fail. There's a chance that SST can get acquired. There's a chance, there's all kinds of things that can happen. There's a chance we just get bored and we're not motivated anymore and we move on, right? There's all kinds of things that can happen with open source. So that risk is always going to be there. It is, you know, the licensing is completely open. So people can fork it, take it. And if they want to run with it, they can. But realistically, like motivation is a big part of it. It's very unlikely someone's going to come around with the same level of motivation we have to make this continue to exist. So that's kind of is a real risk. If there's not enough community interest in supporting it, just like any other open source project that can go away. I will say like we are uh, venture funded. Uh, we went through YC. I will say we look quite different from a lot of these companies. Uh, we are still just three people and we continue to plan to, we continue to plan to be extremely small. I think the reason that you see a lot of bumps with a lot of the other things you might be referencing is the project itself is probably pretty healthy and the business model itself maybe is also even healthy. The mistakes are actually entirely come, they entirely come from maybe someone's first time building a startup. So they made the classic mistakes of, trying to raise it up as much money as possible at as high as a valuation as possible, which immediately means you have to spend all that money as fast as you can, not fast as you can, like within a certain amount of time, which means you grow your team massively, which means like all sorts of other problems show up. Uh, so I think a lot of these things that have failed, I mean, some of them, yes, but I think a lot of them could have been successful. It was more the execution failure. Uh, I think for us, we're not super concerned about that. Everyone on the team, like we've all made those mistakes a million times before. We're being pretty intentional with this. You can go look at projects that are a lot smaller than us in terms of like adoption that have teams that are like, you know, five times our sizes already. But we're being very intentional with growing very sustainably for that reason. We've just been in, we've just seen this enough times to not want to repeat those mistakes. find yourself itching to grow at work, but you're not getting the support you need from your manager? Or maybe you're at a career transition and trying to figure out what you want and how to get it. Or you've got a great job, but could use an external perspective on some tricky cross-functional relationships. Hi, this is K-Ball from JS Party, and these are the exact types of problems I'm helping folks with in my new business. I think about it as pair programming for non-technical problems. If you're curious, you can learn more and sign up for a free exploratory session at kball.llc slash coaching.
what does the contribution distribution look like between sort of members of this the company as opposed to sort of folks in the broader community? Yeah, so this used to look really bad because so ST is on 2.0 right now. From 0.0 to you know, pre 2.0, we were not accepting a lot of contributions because we hadn't really figured out what we were and people wanted to fix things in places that we were planning on blowing up anyway. Uh, SC 2.0 was a full rewrite. Literally, we wrote every single thing. Everyone told us not to, but we did it. And it's at a phase now where it's so, it's like incredibly friendly to uh, accepting contributions. I think within the first two weeks of 2.0 going out, we had more contributors than like the entire previous year. So the distribution is looking a lot better now. And the thing that I said earlier is uh, we, a big thing what we do is we integrate with literally every single framework. We don't use every single framework. Uh, you know, we're here to talk about Open Next. Guess what? No one on the team uses Next.js. So we do not have the expertise to understand how Next.js is supposed to work. What are all the features we need to support? All the little details. Uh, we have a fantastic community that really made Open Next possible. Like digging into like the most obscure stuff that we just would never have understood, and and piecing it together. So yeah, we're always shocked and taken aback by level of effort people put in and the big reason we're able to just be three people and do everything we do you know it's obviously working on the framework but doing the support the marketing design like all kinds of things the reason we're able to stay so small is because obviously we drive the core i think the way we think about it is we kind of get features to like 80 percent, which is pretty easy it's usually the last 20 percent that's tricky the community fills in the last 20 percent with like okay it's not working in this scenario they're just educates let's fix this thing so i'm not going to say that anyone outside of the company is like massively driving the core direction like that is not happening but we do have a lot of activity on uh, just rounding it out and making it a very complete framework and it sounds like a big part of that marketing push uh, would be like the amount of like friendliness that you have in supporting all of these frameworks and and additional add-ons uh, i guess what went into getting that right is that something that you can break down yeah you mean in terms of like how do we the, the, the integrations or like kind of like the environment we create like what yeah, making such a friendly environment to accept integrations. Yeah, I think uh, at the end of the day, I, I mean, I can probably only mostly speak for myself, but I am just a fan of like everything going on. Like no matter what's going on, I'm like super interested in it. Like even if I'm not using it, even if it's something I like explicitly don't want to use, I still am like very interested and excited to learn about it. So I think the reason we've been able to do a lot of these integrations is because I have just been interested in these other projects that I don't even use from a very early stage, um, like all the other meta frameworks, you know, Remix, Next.js, Astro, et cetera. I've been part of those communities for a very long time and I've gotten to know, you know, the founders of them and we're all very close to this point. And we, our stance is like, we just don't have an opinion about what is best. It's if you want to deploy it, you probably have a reason to. Our job is just to make it easy for you to do that. Uh, and obviously all the framework authors love that because they don't want to figure out what the intricacies of AWS, like they want to focus on the front end frameworks features. They don't want to figure out the intricacies of AWS and supporting. Uh, I'm running into like an account limit here. Like how do I fix, like it's just like weird stuff that they would never run into themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's been a really nice relationship where we can take that off their plate by serving everyone that needs to deploy these frameworks in AWS. And uh, you know, the benefit we get is, you know, their community uh, learns about us and uh, we kind of can be involved in, in all these projects that are like, you know, really incredible. And the people behind them are like, we could never do anything like that, but we get to kind of like you know, ride their coattails in a way. Can I ask a few more questions on the, the sort of community side? So it sounds like if I'm understanding correctly right now, in terms of long-term vision, in terms of decision-making, in terms of that, it's all still, it's all kind of centralized within the company. And then you've got a bunch of people doing sort of integration type commits and you know, looking at the GitHub repo that pretty much maps, right? Like there's the three of you with being incredibly productive looking at it. There's like tons and tons of stuff going on. And then like the next commit or has maybe 63 commits and the next one after that is seven. So it's like a lot of people doing edges. Is that kind of your, your vision going forward is to keep it centralized within the company or do you want to start building kind of more of a community vision group or community core maintainers group, things like that? So this is so my opinion here isn't global. It's just kind of scope to the thing we're working on. I'm de like I like the sound of that. I definitely do. Like I would love to have this be a much bigger thing than it is today. But the speed that we need to move at, given the the space, like the phase we're in, 
and like the level of commitment we would need for someone to like meaningfully help us make some of these decisions. It's a lot to ask. And it's kind of unlikely, at least for now, it's unlikely that someone can have that level of influence without this being their full-time thing. So at some point we will grow the team. So obviously it'll, it'll go that way, but realistically where we are now, we are still trying to grow it. And the thing with startups, specifically in the dev tool world, um, you often have to kill your own thing because there's just you discover there's a better way of doing things. It's painful because you already have a set of people that like your current thing and I like the way you're doing it. But if you think long term, if there is a better way to do it, your thing eventually just goes away because there is a better way to do it. So you have no option. You have to adopt the better thing. And that's hard, right? We've had waves between the different version uh, versions of SST where we've definitely lost people because they didn't like the direction we went. But with each wave, like we've gotten a lot better and gotten a lot more accessible and more people find what we do useful, but it did require like shedding some people. And it's always painful, even us internally, like fully aligned with thinking long term, we struggle with that. So that's why it's, it's a little bit hard to, unless you're like, your fate is really tied to the future of this project and the way it is for ours. It's hard to like, really like, you know, collaborate in that way. It's a bit different with other things that are like you know, with something, something like a front end framework that can definitely be a much more open process because it, it just doesn't, it's not just exposed to the same level of like, like we don't really, we, we're not even sure if we are allowed to exist yet. Right. So we're still in that phase. Uh, once we get to the place where we're like, okay, this thing exists and it's good. Like then we can kind of think about some of those things. It's an interesting direction where you say, are we allowed to exist? Right. And I think one of the the beautiful things about open source and software and, and startups to it, some extent is like if you can make it in some ways like you push that boundary and you wait and see if reality pushes you back are y'all engaging with so your primary focus it sounds like is aws are you engaging with folks there at all yeah so we have a very tricky relationship with them and i'll just be kind of very honest about it so initially when we started doing all this stuff I tried to engage more with AWS open source. We're built on some of their open source stuff. You know, that I expected to have a very normal open source relationship because I work with all of these other open source projects. Like, and I've been in open source for a while. So I had what I thought was, okay, this is just going to be another one of those relationships. It's a little, AWS open source is a little bit different. I think what I like about work, like when, like when I work with the solid JS team or I work in the Astro team, the people leading those efforts are like very bought into what they're doing. And that's like, Maybe not even their full time job. It's just like a thing that they're doing. And they're, very, they're like kind of betting their future on it. So it's very easy for me to spend some time there and get connected and like understand their way of thinking and align myself. And like we can kind of do stuff efficiently. It's like we're effectively coworkers at that point. The tough part of AWS open source is any interaction with them, it's kind of like it resets every single time you interact with them. They don't remember who I am, they don't remember that. I have spent more time in their code base than anyone outside of AWS. Like every interaction feels like, like I wasn't, I'm not able to like build up any kind of like relationship with anyone there. And it's a little bit tricky because the team there is rotating, like, you know, people leave AWS and they don't really care about the project anymore. They're not as tied to it. So it's been tough for me to have a similar type of relationship there. And that's more of an example of what I think of as like, like we are trying to be a business as well. But I think we still retain the type of open source feel that I'm used to from other like, you know, purely open source projects. Uh, the AWS open source projects, it definitely feels more like, okay, this is like a corporate sponsored thing. And there's like kind of like an invisible wall and you don't really know what goes on behind it. So it's been tough to be productive. You know, like I, they don't feel like my coworkers. They feel like very, like I can't really, really reach them. Um, and the other flip side of this, and this, this hasn't helped with, um, my role is to help people use AWS but also to convince people to use AWS when I think it's appropriate. For me to do that well, I need to be really honest about where it's bad or like where it sucks or like where, when you should not use it. So I'm, as much as I spend most of my day trying to help people use AWS, I spend an equivalent amount of time like being very critical about them. Their like environment is just different. Like I think when they see that me be critical, I think their level of sensitivity to it is different than what I see in like, you know, like the crazy front end world where everyone's like on each other all the time. So because of that, I think that's also stressed the relationship a little bit. From my perspective, it's weird because I'm like, you know, compared to what's going on in the front end world, I'm like the most reasonable person on the planet. But I think from their perspective, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, I think they interpret it a little bit differently. And by the way, this, this record, if, if they, if someone from their team like sees it, they're, they're going to post it and it's going to be like, you know, a thing that they talk about internally. It's, uh, so it's tough. Like I haven't, I've tried to build stuff there, but just culturally very different. And, uh, 
The, uh, the third issue is they also have internal competing projects to SST. So there's like that whole angle of it. It's just complicated. You would think we just have a direct partnership, but a lot of things complicated. Do you see SST ever going beyond AWS and into some of the other serverless platforms out there? Yeah. So, um, so the, historically we've been built on top of AWS CDK, which is very AWS focused. We do plan to shift that over the next year and be built on top of Terraform. Not exactly to support the other cloud providers like Google Cloud or Azure. The reason we home on AWS is because to build something fully serverless, there's certain primitives you need. And AWS really is the only place that has that. But there are emerging like components that everyone is sprinkling in with AWS deployment. Like me personally, I use PlanetScale for my database. I don't use AWS. But that lives like outside of SST right now. And we want to like make sure we can support other providers that are complementary to like even if your core is on AWS, you might be using, you know, plan for database or like, you know, some of these other like one off. We've been thinking about as unbundling. There's a bunch of providers that are unbundling serverless offerings in AWS and building like a very good experience for one specific part of it. Uh, and more and more people are using that. We want to make sure you can kind of control all that within your SC application, which you cannot do today. Uh, so we do want to support that. Are we going to offer like the exact same experience, but do it on Google Cloud or Azure? That's pretty unlikely. Hello, friends. This is Jared here to tell you about Changelog++. Over the years, many of our most diehard listeners have asked us for ways they can support our work here at Changelog. We didn't have an answer for them for a long time, but finally, we created Changelog++, a membership you can join to directly support our work. As a thank you, we save you some time with an ad-free feed, sprinkle in bonuses like extended episodes, and give you first access to the new stuff we dream up. Learn all about it at changelog.com slash plus plus. You'll also find the link in your chapter data and show notes. Once again, that's changelog.com slash plus plus. Check it out. We'd love to have you with us. This might be shifting slightly, but now I'm curious about, you know, one of the things we wanted to talk about today was open next JS. And, you know, I love some of the, the like way you all are leaning into the snarkiness there. And I think, you know, next is actually a great example of the challenges of having for-profit companies and hosting companies owning or driving development of open source frameworks, because the reason you need open next is because next has gotten so hooked into Vercel and Vercel's layer. Does Open Next build on top of SST? Should we be calling it AWS Next? No, because Open... So, okay, it right now is very focused on AWS. So it definitely is like very tied to AWS. I don't know if that is going to be something... It's a very young project. I don't know how it's going to evolve over time. I think Open Next is an appropriate name. Uh, I can see us expanding outside of like just the AWS output that we do now. It's time with SST. Is when an ST user wants to deploy Next.js, we use Open Next under the hood. Um, we could have just made this an SST thing, but the thing that we recognized was there's so many disparate parties doing this, like recreating this effort, whether it's uh, other you know businesses like Netlify or Amplify, or like there's there were like there were like half a dozen like open source attempts at doing this that were kind of fragmented. Uh, we realized, okay, we have a pretty solid community that's always bugging us about how we deploy Next.js AWS. And we're always like, we don't know, we don't use it. And there was enough of a buildup of that demand. We're like, okay, I think we're in a good position where we can give it a shot and our community can help us kind of actually nail it. Um, so let's try to like create an open source thing because I don't really think this thing needs to be closed source the way it is in these other, other uh, companies. I just, I don't think they're doing it in like a malicious way or anything. I just think they haven't, hadn't thought about it or like there's an overhead of making it open source they didn't want to deal with. Um, But we want to centralize the effort on figuring out how to deploy Next.js to to various environments. So what goes into building an adapter for Next, for AWS? Like what are the, what are kind of the highlighted pieces that, that need to exist? Yeah. So uh, Next.js has a crazy set of features. You know, I think they are kind of similar to us where they started in a narrow place. And anytime a user ran into a rough edge, they're like, we're going to solve it. It doesn't matter uh, what it is. If it's a rough edge, we're going to address it. Um, And I think what they were able to rely on is some of this can't entirely be solved just in the framework. There needs to be complementary, like things that your host 
does to support it. So anything, so obviously there's like, you know, you take your app, you you can split it up into a bunch of different functions. You'll be able to deploy these function, these things as serverless functions. Uh, there's things like ISR, incremental static regeneration, you know, that requires like asynchronous processing of different routes in your application. There's things like the image resizing, you know, that requires like an image resizer thing to run. I think Next.js's position is you can always just run this in a container and the container can do all of that because it's like a long running task, which I think for a lot of people does work. And I think, uh, you know, you can see people, platforms like Flight Control, like they do deploy Next.js in that way to people's AWS accounts. But the people we target are kind of the people, it's less the people that are like just deploying their Next.js app for the first time because you just use Vercel. Like we actually mostly, when people come to us and say, uh, we want to put Next.js in AWS, we like kind of make sure that they shouldn't just be using Vercel. Uh, it's usually people that are at a higher scale um, where the Vercel pricing gets too expensive or like, it's weird just to have like one part of their app, which maybe might even be like the lowest value part of the app, like in a completely separate place when everything else in AWS. So for organizational purpose, they want it all in one place. Those are the people we try to address and they definitely need like serverless deployment so that the pricing is as cheap as it can be and they're using their resources in an effective way and like the performance is as, as good as it can be. So yeah, the architecture itself, because Next.js has so many features in it, uh, it's not straightforward for the average person to figure out how to like one, what even is architecture inside AWS? It's kind of a pretty like wonky architecture you have to come up with. And two, how do I like massage the output that you get from Next.js into actually working? There's like all these little flags you need to set. There's all these little, uh, both on the Next.js side, but also on the AWS side. Um, it just took a ton of trial and error of us like deploying through Vercel and like looking at the little output and then like deploying through our thing. And we're like, okay, it doesn't match. Like how do we like, kind of just going through that process? And we're gonna, we're gonna have to continue to do with every new version of Next.js. So we're always gonna be a little bit behind. It's always gonna be a little bit worse because Vercel can mix and match. Like they can use AWS for some things, they can use Cloudflare for other things, whereas we can't do that. But the benefit being one, the pricing and the performance might be good enough for most people, which is what we think and we think it is. Uh, and two, just like the control of having it alongside the rest of your stuff. Yeah, speaking of those features, does OpenNext support Next13's app directory? Yeah, so we do support Next13's app directory. Uh, I think one of our biggest like contributors has been using that since the beginning. There's some stuff that I think, so there's other features in SST that are unrelated to Next, but are used in Next. Like uh, we have a whole secret system, which requires top level of weight. I believe if you use app directory, top level of weight doesn't work unless you enable another flag that's experimental. So besides that, it like pretty much works out of the box. Nice. Yeah, that's why we were initially looking at SST because like AWS uh, Amplified doesn't support the app directory yet. Yeah. And that's a good example of why we believe in the open source model beyond just uh, it just being a thing we're doing arbitrarily. Uh, when there's an issue with Amplify, you guys have to file an issue and wait for them to prioritize it. Whereas for us, there are plenty of things people brought up where we're like, that's not our concern right now, but then they just went and fixed it. So with something like this, you just need, it's just nice to have that support. I think someone was someone in the past couple of days uh, also had an issue where like when they added Google Analytics, then Amplify stopped caching all of their pages, and then they ended up switching to SST, so they can kind of control some of those those header settings in the CDN. Um, so control is important, and like if you don't need control, you can probably just use Vercel. So uh, if you're gonna like be an alternative, like you do need to give people like, kind of like power user features. So. You talked about open next, you know, eventually potentially, or like the, the motivation was everybody's trying to do this for their own providers. Do you feel like you have identified kind of the core set of, of capabilities that are needed? And are those abstracted in a way that, for example, if a Netlify wanted to, you know, build an integration to open next rather than trying to do their own thing, they could plug into it? Yeah, I think they could. I think the little, the little, I'm just not super familiar with exactly what they do. So I don't know how much help we even would be at least today. Netlify is similar to Vercel where like, why would they just limit themselves to AWS? I think it provide a much better offering through some like crazier architecture. They should just do that because that's a great way for them to, you know, compete and offer a better service. I do think Open Next will eventually get there where we allow like, okay, here's like the AWS only configuration or here's the best AWS plus Cloudflare configuration or here's about it. So I think we will eventually get to that and we'd love to have a centralized effort there. Um, but you can see why given Netlify has already done this, they probably would just continue down that route versus like kind of like starting over. Like, I feel like if you're at the beginning, if you're like starting a new hosting platform now, you're very likely to help us because that like boosts you forward. 
and like Amped, which is another, which is a serverless platform. They support Next.js 12, but not 13. I think they're very likely to just use Open Next and help contribute to it because they don't have anything right now. Uh, where someone from that as the night of the fly, they're like further along, so I don't know if they would they would shift over. Yeah, I mean, thinking as a developer, I don't want to deal with migrations if I change hosting providers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's why I'm like, okay, give me everything. <laughs> you know, I maybe I, right now I'm on Netlify. Right now I have a couple sites on Netlify. If I were building a next app, I'd probably do it there so I don't have to set up new accounts. But if it takes off, I want to be able to migrate it without having to change a bunch of stuff around. Yeah, we, we see a lot of people coming from Vercel, obviously. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head if we've seen people coming from Netlify. Most of it is from Vercel. And no one, it's pretty much been drop in and everything still works. Like I said, some stuff works with like a little bit worse performance because of the magic that, that Vercel has that we don't. Who is Jim? <laughs> uh, good question. Jim is a random guy. Are you guys, I mean, you're referring to the OpenX video we made. Yeah. Um, have you guys seen the original thing that no. we based it off of? Okay. We based it off of an old Tim and Eric skit called Free Real Estate. It's almost like an exact copy of that video. Uh, and their whole shtick was like, they just made a commercial targeting one random person. So we, we just, <laughs> we just stuck with it. Um, but yeah, a lot of fun making that. A lot of effort, too much effort, but we had fun. Do you want to reenact it here on, on the pod? No, definitely not. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> uh, free! Yeah. Next JS! Yeah. It's like Next JS, but free! Yeah. <laughs> I had not seen that Tim and Eric skit. And so I like I definitely knew that there was something that I was some context that I was missing. We're referencing. Yeah. yeah. We'll have a link to both of those in the show notes. <laughs> The following advertisement is intended for Jim Booney only. It's free. Next.js. We're giving you function. It's free. We're giving you a deployment. It's Next.js. Free. It's a free deployment for you, Jim. This is free. Next.js. Well, you got to bring the code that the deployment is free. Two functions. No servers. It's free. You push a commit to your free Next.js, we got you a deployment. It's a serverless deployment. It's free. It's got a CDN. It, it was funny making that because... Uh, so here's a funny backstory. So Frank who is the, the other one person in the video, one of the founders of SST, pretty quiet. He like just cranks out a bunch of work. You don't really think much of him, but believe it or not, he was on the U17 Chinese soccer team. He's like excellent, excellent soccer player, like, you know, like national level. Then when he went to college, he decided to try to be an actor for a little bit. And he has a few acting credits on a, in a, on a few, you know, like smaller movies. So oh. I will upload this eventually. Uh, I gave him the lines he needed to do and he messaged me like a day later. He's like, here's, here's like a zip file with all the takes. And I like, couldn't breathe. I was like laughing so hard at the take. Like we only, we can only like use like like a quarter of them, but they were all so funny. Like he just like got into oh, this like, crazy the character. Yeah. You gotta yeah. do the yeah, outtakes. Exactly. So I want to post them all. Cause like. I literally kept having a pause, just like recover from laughing. Um, I just couldn't believe the level of effort he put into it. And like, he didn't say anything. He just was like, okay, I'll do it. And then he just gave it to me and didn't like, wasn't like, hey, I tried hard. Well, th- this is marketing gold for you. Like <laughs> I, I have in the past worked at a company trying to own an open source framework um, and run things. And, you know, this is probably why I'm being a little bit more critical because I saw that crash and burn <laughs> um, in real time. But that type of comedic take and the personalities behind it were what, when it was working, really drove a lot of engagement. And so, like, you got to use that, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's definitely something we're like, we start, ever since the beginning of this year, we're like, okay, we got SC2.0, let's figure out what we want to do in terms of marketing. And we're like, you know, let's like stop trying to do, and we're still going to, we still make like educational, like tutorial type content, but let's stop pretending like that's marketing. That's like, once someone already wants to use your stuff, that's when they're going through that. We got to just do fun stuff and make stuff that people just like seeing. Um, and mm-hmm. they'll discover SST like, you know, down the road, whatever. Like we don't need any direct tie in, but it has been working. It's been working really well. And the other video, I mean, I don't know if you saw the other one I did with Fred, the between yeah. two nerds one. Um, <laughs> that was the first one we did. That was like, let's just do something funny, not make it about anything specifically. And I posted it. And like 30 minutes later, like Adam Rackus like quoted it being like, this is really funny. I don't know what SST is, but I'm going to check it out. Then like 10 minutes later, he just posted a link to our docs being like, this looks really cool. And I was like, oh, cool. Like our, our theory was validated, like <laughs> it like step by step in real time immediately. Yeah. So hundred percent. 
Well, and you can combine them too. You yeah. can have like tutorial videos that are goofy, you know, deploying some really bizarre app and yeah. using your personality to drive that storyline. Yeah, exactly. Like there's like, we're just scratching the surface of, of all this. And like, so it's like something like unlocked in our brain where we were just thinking about things in a certain way. If you like scroll our YouTube, like all our old videos look very different. All of a sudden they start looking like a lot different. Something just clicked for us and there's just not a lot of people doing it. So the bar is very, very low right now. There's so much, they, so many places you can take this like themed yeah. conference talks and, and yep. such. Yeah. So do you have a, a shtick or a, like how you show up there? Like Nick has his Mr. Burns. Uh, <laughs> that is just how he greets the world. <laughs> no, I don't. I think for me, uh, this is also weird for me because I, I wouldn't have ever described myself as someone that could like do stuff in front of camera. Like I used to always like make me really nervous and like I would kind of like think too hard about it. But I've been I've been streaming on Twitch like every single day for a while. And it's really like helped me get more comfortable just being I and mean, when you're streaming on Twitch, you're alone in a room talking out loud to yourself. I mean, there's <laughs> other people there listening, but very odd, right? Like you're not really like getting a bunch back uh, until like you get to a certain size and your chat's more active. But yeah, I'm still figuring it out. I think for now. Uh, so our goal is we're, this is a kind of marketing we want to do. We don't particularly think we're like the best in the world at it as we kind of have more of a budget for this stuff, which will happen over the next year. Uh, we just want to find people that are awesome at making content, even outside of tech and just have them come make fun stuff for our community. It's not going to be like selling any of our products or anything. Just like you're really good at making videos that people love watching. Uh, like, angle it a little bit at our community, but like just do your thing. And that's kind of stuff what we want to like invest in and fund. And of course I'd love to be a part of that, but there's just, there's going to be people that are way better than me at doing this stuff. I'm just picturing like Matt Damon <laughs> pitching. <laughs> SST. Well, I mean, I think he learned his lesson with the whole crypto yeah. thing. So I don't know if he's going to be in this space for a bit. Yeah. Isn't he getting sued for like millions of dollars because he was yeah, him and like every other celebrity. It's pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah. It, apparently except Taylor Swift, who was the one celebrity who was smart enough to say, wait a minute, are you pitching unregulated securities? Cause <laughs> that would be legal liability. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether or not you like her music, good businesswoman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's actually a question from the chat, kind of going back a little bit. And you mentioned kind of rebuilding uh, from CDK onto Terraform. And the question was, uh, if you'd be going to CDK Terraform or just to Terraform HCL? Yeah, so we haven't decided. Uh, so our initial plan is we want to initially along, like allow stuff side by side. So continue to use our current setup support stuff from the Terraform world. So you can like spin up Terraform provider resources as well. We're very heavily considering CDK Terraform. The only thing that gives me pause is this is a big shift, right? No matter what version this is we do, it is a big shift. If we're going to make a big shift, I'd love to eliminate as many problems as we can from having been on CDK. So we have a ton of issues with the CDK like design itself. I think the constraints, and again, AWS hates when I say this, but the constraints, the constraints of the CDK was we need to support a lot of different languages. We need to support TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, you know, like a bunch of different languages. So when you design an API for this thing, it is lowest common denominator of like what patterns work across all languages. So you ended up with a very specific style of defining infrastructure in code. And there's a lot of problems that come with that. We are extremely TypeScript focused. So for us, do we want to accept, <laughs> do we want to accept that constraint? Like we, if I was going to build something like CDK from scratch today, just for TypeScript, it would look a lot different and there'd be a bunch of performance benefits from that. There'd be a bunch of type safety benefits from that. It's a bunch of ergonomic things. So CDK TF would be a quick win because it would be very quick to like, you know, put that along to the rest of SST, but it's also an opportunity to like rethink that whole model. I actually built a very simple TypeScript to Terraform like compiler. Uh, that has a completely different API than, than CDK TF that I think is a lot simpler and allows for some interesting things that CDK doesn't allow for. But th th it would just be a lot more work to do that. So we just haven't decided. Like CDK TF is an easy win. Realistically, it's probably where we're going to go. But it's also an opportunity for us to like really rethink some of the stuff. Beyond that, what are what's in the roadmap? What are your sneak peeks for the future? What does SST 3.0 look like? Yeah, so... Uh, 
in the, our roadmap right now is, uh, so 2.0 is a big push. Cause like I said, we like rewrote literally everything. Um, and it's gone to a really great, great place. Now we're looking at the stats and we're like just about to intersect where 2.0 downloads are going to now surpass 3.0 downloads. Uh, sorry, 1.0 downloads. So we're pretty happy and excited, but that happened so quickly. So from here, we are pretty happy with like the scope of things we cover. There's our, it's always like so much stuff we want to do, but we're pretty happy here. So our roadmap, it's, it's actually why I've been streaming on Twitch every day is because I'm working on our now like uh, a production product. That's the console, which is going to be, you know, again, it's going to be mostly free, but there's going to be some paid features in there. So roadmap now is, okay, we have enough of a community. We have enough of a user base to build a nice complementary product that works alongside SST. That's my focus for the next six months, I would say, or so. We're definitely going to get it out earlier and have people like use it as we're building it. So that's a near-term focus. And that should really prove out our models, like you know, our unit economics, everything. Um, we're, we're close to being profitable at our side, like at our current team size. Uh, and I think with this console, we can maybe get to a pretty impressive place given the size of our team. So that's really the focus. Uh, after that, it is going to be this, this Terraform stuff. So I think SST 3.0 is really going to be expanding beyond the world of AWS and whatever and tapping into like the massive, massive Terraform ecosystem to coordinate literally anything. And I, and I was a heavy user of Terraform before I started working at SST. So uh, I'm a fan of that ecosystem and excited to like be back in it. Oh, that's awesome. What, what action would you ask of users to to check out SST? Just go to SST.dev? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Go to SST.dev. Um, we, uh, th- this is an area where like, we're really like trying to rethink because we've just evolved so much and we're still figuring out what the initial experience look like looks like. But I think our docs have improved a lot over the past couple of weeks. Of course, we're in a constant state of never being happy with them, but they definitely are a lot better than where they were before. So there's different entry pads. And I think this is where I feel there's a little bit of confusion. Um, so for most of our users, they are building and like a very, like they're building an application. Part of the application might have a front end framework in it, but it's not the whole application. Like they might have a remix site in there for the front end portions of it, but that's not like the whole thing, right? That's a typical path. And we have a path for that. Uh, but now we also have paths for other situations where maybe your app is simple and it just is a remix site or it just is a Next.js site. It's not worth doing the full SST setup. So we have these like what we call them drop in modes where you can like start with a Next.js app, drop an SST, deploy to AWS. If you need to spin up any additional AWS services, like you want to publish to a queue or you want to run a cron job, whatever, you can do that as well. Uh, so we have paths for that as well. If you're like, if you still want to think primarily in your framework of choice, whatever it is, uh, you can, and then you kind of use ST minimally just to, for the deployment piece. But there's a lot we have to do. Like we support all these frameworks pretty decently today, but we're pushing a lot of these frameworks to support route splitting. So right now, if you like do an Astro site, even if you have hundred routes in there, it supports a single function. There's benefits to splitting it up into maybe not all 100, but splitting it up so they're not just one giant mono function. As these frameworks support that, we need to support that on our end too. And so that's there's there's some work just to make these things perform better in, in AWS. I, I have seen SST, a couple of friends have sent it to me uh before this, like uh like just like, oh, this looks kind of cool. And then I saw the Fred K Shop video, which is amazing. And then the the open next video, which is also amazing. So I, I highly encourage you to keep doing those. Just yeah. so good. We we just got the idea for a next one like yesterday, and I'm like like writing it out, probably filming this week, hopefully get it out next week. Awesome. I cannot wait. <laughs> and I, I would also encourage everyone to to check you out on Twitch. I was actually uh, listening in for a bit today and uh, I just coincidentally happened to catch uh, Tej coming on oh, nice. and talking a little bit. So that was really cool uh, about his open source journey. Yeah. The Twitch community is awesome. Like I haven't been doing it for that long and I've been able to like, everyone just like is down to like, go on each other's streams and just talk and everyone's really fun. And yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I've been, it's a big part of my day every day and it's been great. If you ever need someone to do a like perfect deadpan, like deliver the cold line or whatever, like reach out to bone skull, um, Chris Hiller <laughs> yeah. from JS okay. party. He has the best deadpan and he's got this like great, just like, mm, like. <laughs> do you have an example of that? I love this. I mean, we definitely need more variety. So that sounds awesome. So like, uh, I don't know if he'd be into it. Cause I don't know how much he actually enjoys doing that. Versus <laughs> that's just who Chris is. Uh, but he is the best, like, just like funny, not taking your 
type yeah. of guy. <laughs> that sounds pretty useful in the kind of things we want to do. So it would be cool. JavaScript should be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, his voice sounds familiar. I feel like maybe I've, I've seen him around before. I mean, do you listen to our show? <laughs> I actually haven't. So, <laughs> well, I will now. Yeah, no, Chris is, Chris is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And, um, He's good on that. Like Nick and I are, are just goofy, but he's funny without even, as far as I can tell, trying. <laughs> Man, that's so lucky. It's a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dax, thank you so much for coming on. We'll have links to all of these things, including these awesome videos to SST and uh, to everything in our show notes. And uh, anything else you want to plug before we let you go? No, I think we're all good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on and talking about all this. Uh, this is probably the most in-depth I've gone in a little bit. So appreciate it. It was fun. Yeah, well, we definitely appreciate it as well. And I uh, cannot wait to dig in more to Open Next and SST and getting them both up and running. So, uh, yeah, thank you. And we'll catch you next time. All right, that is JS Party for this week. Thanks for listening. If this is your first time with us, subscribe to the pod to get your weekly dose of web dev goodness delivered directly to your inbox, your favorite podcast app, your Spotify library, your Twitter feed, however you like to listen to podcasts, we got you covered. Head to jsparty.fm for all the ways to subscribe. And if you're a longtime listener, do us a solid by sharing JS Party with your friends and colleagues. We appreciate you helping us spread the word. Thanks also to our partners Fastly and Fly for helping us bring you awesome pods each and every week. And to the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder for keeping our beat supply all topped up. Next up on the pod, Amelia and myself are joined by artist slash programmer Alex Miller to discuss how he uses low-tech web tools to make high-impact art installations online and off. Stay tuned right here. We'll have it ready for you next week. How often do people just leave when you do the outro? <laughs> Probably. Uh, I can't remember the last time. I don't know if happened. I've ever seen it. Yeah. Okay. Because every time I'm always worried, like when I'm doing it from like your point of view, I'm always like, don't leave, don't leave. Like I'm worried there's oh, no yeah. way I actually leave. <laughs> that has happened once, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>